This lesson discusses water budgets in terms of two key topics, the hydrologic cycle and topographic maps. Support for the development of this lesson has been provided by the National Science Foundation through the Ohio University Boat of Knowledge in the Science Classroom Program. What do you think a water budget is? What does a water budget tell us, and why would this information be useful? Take a minute and discuss your ideas. A water budget estimates the amount of water in each component of the water cycle. We can think of a water budget like a bank account. We have deposits, withdrawals, and the final balance. In water budget terms, the deposits are called inflow, the withdrawals are called outflow, and the balance is the change in storage. Just like our bank book tells us if we have surplus or deficit, the water budget tells us where we have extra water availability and where we have shortages. We can use this information to create a water balance graph, which helps us to visualize surpluses and deficits. When the precipitation exceeds the evapotranspiration, we have a surplus. But notice that between May and September, the typical dry months, evapotranspiration is greater than precipitation. This tells us two things, that more moisture is entering the atmosphere than leaving, which leaves us with a deficit that is compensated for by groundwater storage. When precipitation is once again higher than evapotranspiration, we see a period of recharge where the groundwater is replaced before we are back to surplus again. Let's look at the water cycle and try to guess what the inflows and outflows would be in the water budget as we go through the steps of the water cycle. Water enters the atmosphere through evaporation and evapotranspiration. Once the water is in the atmosphere, it undergoes condensation and transportation before becoming precipitation and leaving the atmosphere. Evaporation and evapotranspiration are always outflows, and precipitation is always an inflow. Groundwater discharge and stream flow can be either inflow or outflow, depending on whether more water is entering or leaving the system. Before we continue with the water budget, let's define the major players in the water cycle. Evaporation occurs when water goes from liquid to gaseous state and enters the atmosphere. Evapotranspiration is similar, but the water vapor is given off by plants. Condensation occurs after water vapor enters the atmosphere. At this stage, the water vapor droplets turn to liquid water and form clouds. Transportation describes the movement of water through the atmosphere, and precipitation occurs when water is released from the clouds. Water that enters the system as precipitation either ends up in surface waters like lakes, rivers, streams, wetlands, or the ocean, or groundwater. We'll see shortly that surface water and groundwater are treated as two separate entities in the water budget, but it's important to remember that they are connected. Now that we know a little bit about the water cycle, we can break down the inflows and outflows into the water budget equation shown here. The water budget equation tells us that the change in storage is determined from precipitation, change in stream discharge, evapotranspiration, and change in groundwater flow. Whether we add or subtract the terms depends on whether they are classified as inflows or outflows. Evapotranspiration is always subtracted because we know it's an outflow but change in stream discharge and change in groundwater flow can be either added or subtracted, depending on the situation. We can simplify the water budget calculation for a watershed that doesn't have wells and is self-sustaining. No wells means we can assume there is no change in groundwater flow, and self-sustaining tells us that there is no change in storage. Then we can rewrite the water budget equation to state that precipitation plus the change in stream discharge minus the evapotranspiration equals zero. Before we go much further with our water budget discussion, let's take a moment to define watersheds, since this is the closed system that's being considered when we calculate a water budget. Here we have two examples of watersheds, the Sunday Creek watershed at Trimble High School in Gloucester, Ohio, and the Hawking watershed in Southeast Ohio. Looking at these two pictures, how would you define a watershed? Take a few minutes to discuss.
A watershed is defined as an area of land that is bound by elevations that guide water within that region to flow to a single designated point. What does all that really mean? This definition is telling us that all drops of water that fall anywhere within this region will eventually end up at the same point, at the end of the watershed. If the water droplet falls outside the watershed boundaries, it is part of a different watershed and flows to a different point. Now the question becomes, how do we know which way the water will flow? If we take a walk through the woods, we won't come across a watershed boundary conveniently placed to tell us which way the water will flow. So how do we even begin to delineate the watershed boundary? We can answer this question by completing this statement. Water flows from blank points of elevation or energy to blank points of elevation or energy. Elevation and energy are used interchangeably in this statement because the answer deals with the concept of potential and kinetic energy transfer. Try to fill in the blanks. Water flows from high elevations to low elevations. So how do we get elevations? We can use topographic maps to get elevations. What is a topographic map? Topographic maps, or topo maps for short, show the elevation layout of an area using contour lines that connect points of the same elevation. Contours that are close together indicate quick changes in elevation. Do you think the slope of closely placed contours is steeper or more gradual than contours that are spaced farther apart? Contours that are close together indicate a steep slope. Let's look at some examples of topo maps. On the left side, we have a section of USGS map for the Hocking Hills State Park region in Ohio. The contours are labeled every 100 feet and each contour represents a 20-foot change in elevation. We can tell that this region on the right side is much steeper than the region on the left side of the map. If we wanted a profile view of a region, we could plot the elevations based on the horizontal spacing between the contours, as shown in the picture on the right. In doing so, we get an idea of what the area looks like. The contours on a topo map give us an idea of elevations, slopes, and water flow. Contours point upstream in valleys and point down ridges. How do you think topo maps are made? Take a few minutes to discuss your ideas. Topo maps can be hand drafted using the triangular irregular network or TIN method. The TIN method involves five steps. First, elevation data needs to be collected through a land survey of the area. With elevation data points known, the next step is to pick an interval for the contours. Typical intervals can be 1 foot, 10 foot, or 100 feet, like we saw in the USGS map. The contour interval size will depend on the scale of the project. Smaller regions might be mapped in 1 foot or 10 foot intervals, but large areas are mapped in 100 foot intervals. The third step involves connecting all the elevation points using a triangular network. Once all the points are connected, the fourth step divides the lines into equal segments based on the chosen contour interval. In the final step, the points with equal elevation are connected to form a smooth contour line. When drawing the contour lines in the fifth step, it's important to remember that you must leave every triangle that you enter. In other words, you can't have a contour line that just ends abruptly. Let's go through the TIN method to create a topo map like the one shown on the right side. We already have elevation data, and since it's a relatively small region, we will use one foot intervals, so the first two steps are complete. What should we do next? We create a triangular network by connecting points with different elevations. Now we're ready for the fourth step. In the fourth step, we divide each of the lines between the points using the one foot interval. Each time we mark an interval, we make a small hash mark that's perpendicular to the line. Then in step five, we connect all the hash marks that represent the same elevation. 
Once we finish connecting the hash marks, we have our contour lines for our topo map complete. Now that we have an understanding of watersheds and topo maps, let's try a water budget problem. We want to estimate the average yearly evapotranspiration amount in cubic feet for the Sunday Creek watershed near Trimble High School in Athens County, Ohio. We will assume no changes in storage or groundwater flow. Take a minute and try to write out the water budget equation that we will use to solve this problem. Remember that the water budget equation is precipitation plus change in stream discharge minus evapotranspiration plus change in groundwater flow equals change in storage. But we said no changes in storage or groundwater flow, so delta G and delta S will be set equal to zero, which means we can use a simplified version of the equation. P plus delta R minus ET equals zero. So what data do we need in order to solve this problem? Remember our equation. We're trying to solve for ET, so we need values for precipitation and stream discharge. We'll also need to know the watershed area so we can convert the evapotranspiration amount from cubic feet to inches. The values that we will use to solve this problem are 40 inches per year for average precipitation, negative 102 cubic feet per second for stream discharge, and 104 square miles for watershed area. Let's go through the steps for determining the values for each term. To find the average precipitation, we can reference historic precipitation information. We can use this average annual precipitation map, knowing that Sunday Creek is located in Athens County, to find the average precipitation is between 39 and 41 inches per year. We'll use an average value of 40 inches per year for our calculations. To find the mean discharge in watershed area, we'll have to use some external sources. We can find information about precipitation and stream flow from the USGS Water Data website or from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources website. We can get watershed information from the EPA website or from the USGS Interactive Stream Stats map. Let's start by finding the mean discharge and then determine the watershed area. Start by going to the USGS Water Data website by following the link shown and select Ohio from the map. You'll be redirected to another page for Ohio Streamflow. On this page, click the link for the statewide streamflow table. You'll be taken to another page where you can select the site. Type in Sunday Creek at Gloucester. On the next page, click on the station number for Sunday Creek at Gloucester. You'll be redirected to another page where you should select Annual Statistics from the drop-down menu for available data. You will then be prompted to select the output format for your table. Make sure to check the box for discharge and change from water year to calendar year, then submit. The website will give you a table with the stream discharge in cubic feet per second for each year. We'll take the average of the discharge data in the table to get the mean discharge, which comes to approximately 102 cubic feet per second. We're going to make this amount negative in the water budget equation because it represents discharge, water leaving the system. Now we'll determine the watershed area by using the USGS StreamStats interactive map. Once you've entered the interactive map user interface, zoom to Gloucester, Ohio. You'll get an image on the map like this that shows Gloucester and surrounding creeks and roads. Next, Select the Watershed Delineation from a Point tool. Zoom in on the map to Sunday Creek at the point where it runs past Trimble High School and click on the stream. After the tool finishes calculating, the watershed will be highlighted on the map in red. With the Delineation tool still open, click the Compute Basin Characteristics button. Leave the default selections in the pop-up window and click Compute Basin Characteristics. From the table of basin characteristics that's generated, we can find the drainage area to be 104 square miles. Now we have everything we need in order to complete the water budget calculation. We'll start by converting the precipitation value from inches per year into cubic feet. We'll do this by multiplying the watershed area by the average precipitation. 
remember to include conversions from inches to feet and from square miles to square feet. Next, we'll convert the stream discharge from cubic feet per second to cubic feet per year. Now we can calculate the evapotranspiration as precipitation minus stream discharge. We can also report evapotranspiration in terms of inches over the watershed by dividing the evapotranspiration volume by the watershed area. For more practice with water budgets, watersheds, and topo maps, complete these additional activities that are included with the lesson. In the watershed topo map model activity, you will construct a saltwater map watershed model and take elevation point data from your watershed using a ruler. Plot the elevation points on paper and use the TIN method to draw contours and develop the topo map for your watershed. You can also create a water balance graph for a stream near you. Choose a stream and follow the steps outlined in the example problem to find the monthly precipitation for one year and the average discharge per month. Then estimate the evapotranspiration per month, assuming no change in groundwater flow or storage. Plot the precipitation and evapotranspiration either by hand or using Excel to create a water balance graph like that shown on slide 3. Finally, identify the surpluses and deficits from the graph.